people that are here already, I guess, uh, I mean, if you if you guys want in, you can uh, go out for a tea or coffee break, or maybe I can start it off uh, with some open-ended questions that I have from my side, and uh, to grab a better knowledge about uh, what kind of audience I'm serving. So, uh, uh, I mean, does anybody need to go out, or should I start my questions? Uh, it's it's a normal poll, and uh, there'll be more of a discussion sort of thing. So uh, that's what I intend to have before I uh, kickstart with the performance. Okay, so. Uh, when you when you don't actually raise your hand, I assume that you are saying yes that you want to be over here and not go out for a tea or coffee break. So uh, let me start off with this as to uh, how many people are uh, have actually measured their page load time and know it by heart uh, as to what it is for today. How many? How many of you just with a show of hand can tell me actually as to how many uh, in how much time their page is actually loading? So the people who have actually raised up their hand, uh, can anybody tell me who has less than five seconds of their page load time? I'm talking about the total page load time. Uh, I'm not talking about the start render time for now. It was li less than five seconds, but around four point something. Okay. And what about the start render time? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, okay. So uh, might not. Might, I actually uh, can give a context because uh, we are still having a lot of time. Maybe uh, 20 minutes. So uh, I. Uh, I through some uh, interactions that I had so far uh, with the people outside of this particular room, people were actually thinking that maybe it uh, will also discuss about the page load performance. Uh, though in my talk, I'll be specifically, uh, I mean, discussing more about the rendering performance and not the networking performance per se. So uh, maybe I can have a discussion as of now uh, regarding the networking performance. And uh, in case you guys, uh, anybody has any specific questions regarding the same, you can have, have it already. So. Uh, First of all, let me actually uh, give you a glossary for the same as, uh, as to when I say it's uh, start load time and uh, the start render time. Uh, what do you mean by start render time is, uh, okay, so let's make it a bit interactive and let me ask any, any one of you who can actually describe me as to what is uh, the start render time. Can anybody, uh, can anybody, uh, anybody give me a, a small set of, uh, a small definition for the same, saying as, saying as to what it uh, basically describes, the start render time. Anyone? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So is it the entire HTML or is it some part of HTML? After the head completes. Okay. So how much portion of the HTML? How much portion of the HTML then? Or to put it in simpler words, um, Okay, so this is close to the answer, uh, both of yours. Uh, the thing is that it's the first pixel that touches your screen, uh, the first uh, paint operation that happens, uh, that basically describes your uh, start render time, which is also the DOM content loaded, uh, as you can see in your networking panels. Uh, so first of all, with a show of hand, how many of you actually use uh, Chrome, Chrome Dev Tools? Okay. The rest of you, I assume, might be using Firefox, I guess, for debugging, right? Any other tool apart from this uh, when it comes to, first of all, uh, debugging it on your local to check how much time it is uh, taking up for uh, uh, your page to load? Any other tool apart from this on your local when you have to test it out on local? Yeah, Viceflow will be online, uh, and when you only deploy it, only then will you, able, will you be able to see, actually see it, right? Okay, so using their APIs, I guess you give your HTML, and then uh, uh, that's another way. Okay, anything apart from, apart from this? Okay, uh, I haven't used Fiddler, but uh, what all data uh, will it give you? Oh, sure, okay. The networking timeline and uh, the blocking resources or something of that sort, right? Okay. So, uh, regarding net networking performance, uh, I mean, there's a key thing that I'll, I'll actually uh, mention at most of the times is to make uh, most of your things asynchronous. I mean, whatever you can, make it asynchronous. By what I mean asynchronous is that there should be nothing that will be blocking, uh, that will be render blocking basically, that when your page is getting loaded up and it is uh, getting started to paint, there shouldn't be any resource for which the browser has to stop your rendering or to display the first pixel onto your screen. It has to load for that particular resource. When you're done with this particular uh, thing of making everything asynchronous, most of your job has been done. And uh, I mean, most of the op optimization has been taken care of uh, re in regard to the start render time. Apart from that, when it comes to image optimization and something of the other sort, it's regarding the page load time per se. So that is how you can accomplish a start pixel render time. 
So uh, I guess each one of you have understood the difference between the two as to what is uh, page load time and the start render time, right? So uh, now, uh, I mean, most of you will be able to go back and do it by yourself. Um, making it, uh, okay, how many of you actually use uh, page speed insights to know as to what score is of your website? Okay, one or two hands, three, four, five, six, okay, 10, around 10. Uh, okay, and uh, what is the score that you try to touch upon? Is it 90, 80? Okay, you try to make it 90. Have you uh, put in an automation tool that allows you to see as to uh, if it drops below 80, it uh, gives you an alert? Maybe grunt task, yeah. I mean, mostly that, that is also we use. Okay, okay. Uh, anybody who's uh, having this practice in place in their deployment process? Okay, one more hand. So, uh, uh, page speed inside is one. Maybe web page test is another that you can actually touch upon. How many of you have actually used uh, web page test? Uh, I mean, most, uh, at most of your deployments to see as to what the score is of web page test, or is it uh, just about page speed inside? No one actually uses web page test for uh, knowing about their performance? Is it so? I'm able to see just three hands for now. Okay. I guess web page test is not that popular or might be because of some sort of complexity that people think of. Uh, but yeah, it's a great tool anyway, and uh, it gives you a lot more insights as compared to page speed inside. Uh, which is a set of rules that actually tell you whether you're breaking any of them or not. So uh, that is what PageSpeed Insight does. But as she said, that uh, to monitor her uh, uh, web page performance, she actually uses PageSpeed Insight and has a grunt or a gulp uh, task to run in to actually tell whether uh, the, uh, the PageSpeed score is below a certain threshold or not. So that uh, in case it triggers up and brings up an alert uh, to her, she can basically understand uh, whether the deployment that is going to, uh, I mean, run in production, uh, whether it's performant or not, in terms of the networking performance. I'm not talking about the rendering performance for now. So that is what, uh, I mean, everyone should have in, if possible, yeah? Oh, okay, in the, uh, in the Chrome DevTools, okay. So yeah, this is the other way. So maybe you are uh, starting up via Selenium WebDriver or anything of that sort and then uh, running it up by yourself. So yeah, that's another thing that you can do. PageSpeed uh, Insights also provides you an API with which you can send in the HTML. Uh, get to know whether it's performant or not, whether there's a render blocking resource or not. It will load it up by itself and let you know about the things. Uh, that can be a failure. Uh, so that is one part of it. Uh, I guess I have uh, consumed like 15 minutes for now. Uh, there's 15 minutes that is left before I start off this conversation because otherwise people will be uh, missing in upon that thing. So in case you have any other question apart from this, uh, let's try to pitch it up and uh, let's, let's j discuss them. Uh, any, any specific questions for now? Yeah. For minification, uh, for minification of CSS and JavaScript, or it is about uh, compression of images? CSS and uh, JavaScript minification, right? Okay. So uh, when you say about that, it's totally upon using uh, the automated tools, uh, automated tasks like uh, available in Grunt and Gulp. So that is what uh, I use by myself. And uh, yeah, that is uh, pretty, uh, I mean, comprehensive uh, to give you uh, e any of the options that you want to uh, in case of minification. Yeah, so there are several options that you can also pass in as to uh, what level of minification or compression do you want to do uh, with your CSS and JavaScript files. So it's pretty comprehensive. Uh, have you tried that upon by yourself for now? Or facing any issues, if you have? Uh, okay, I'm not aware of uh, what the Microsoft uh, community uh, is using for now, but uh, Grunt and Gulp have their automated task that is, uh, uh, is a contribution by the community itself. Uh, which does the minification. Uh, not a lot of uh, things are involved in it, and there will be hardly some difference in the minification or, uh, that is happening through those tasks as compared to what is uh, available via uh, the tool that you prescribed. So, uh, yeah, I mean. Okay. 
I mean, I'm not aware of uh, such issues, but maybe it totally depends upon the configuration of the tool that you're using. So uh, I haven't faced such issues uh, when using Grunter. So that's what I can say. But maybe uh, when using that particular tool that you have just uh, suggested, uh, maybe, yeah. So it is, uh, uh, it is a task. It's an open source uh, tool uh, by the name Grunt or Gulp, whatever you want to choose. Um, and uh, you can simply use that. Uh, and it uh, allows you to actually install the tasks using NPM module. So yeah, that's, what, that's how you can use it. And it, it will run uh, irrespective of what the environment you're having, whatever, whatever uh, backend you're having. Uh, it, it will run irris irrespective of that. Unless and until it's a build task. So maybe you'll have to trigger that particular uh, automation task after, you, after you're done with the build of uh, your own environment. Yep. Any other question? Okay. Okay. What kind of testing framework do you want to? Okay. Okay. Sure, yeah. Okay. Okay. So first is, uh, I mean, when it comes to performance testing, it's uh, uh, you either have uh, some uh, tasks that we just discussed about uh, grunt which allows you to actually couple with the page speed inside API and then uh, passing your HTML and see whether it's having a blocked in resource or, I mean, those rules, apply those rules and see if any of them are failing or not, okay? So one is that, uh, in case you want to monitor your page speed performance uh, from the ground up uh, as a, sta a static user monitoring, okay? I'm not going into the real user monitoring because that's a bit expensive to have in, but in case of static user monitoring, maybe page speed inside is something that you can look out for and uh, automate it uh, with the grunt task as we discussed before. Along with that, there's also uh, webpagetest.org, as I discussed before, and they have their API as well, uh, which is having a grunt task as well. So you can simply use that, and they provide you, I mean, uh, data for most of the thing, uh, regarding your page load time and whatnot. And they run it on uh, a couple of different locations, so you can specify all of them. Or in case you're having a, uh, having a need which requires a lot more requests, uh, thereby surpassing their uh, public API limit. So you can basically have a private instance of your own of webpagetest.org and run it by yourself. So maybe that is something that you can uh, think about or explore. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, everything. Any, yeah. Okay. Sure, yeah. So when it comes to actually, <clears throat> I assume that you're talking about a single page application, is it? So uh, when it comes to that, uh, we are actually, uh, I mean, having in a similar situation uh, where we are having a single page application, there's a single JavaScript file which is uh, built uh, with a concatenation file, then comes under minification, and then it's how uh, it's deployed to our server. So uh, when it comes to that, it's not actually that you can uh, uh, display a lot onto your web page. But what we do is basically have it render blocking, that is, load it asynchronously. That way, we'll be able, we'll be able to at least display the loader to the user for now, though it has to be something that should be uh, done, uh, I mean, uh, in modules, I would say. So when, yeah, so we have, uh, so we basically uh, load our uh, JavaScript asynchronously so that it does not block uh, the particular uh, piece of HTML, which basically displays the loading uh, screen. Okay, so at least that that is something that you should really have in because at least uh, on mobile or whether say about desktop uh, because the size of that particular JavaScript is quite huge considering a single page application, a person won't be able to see any pixel on his screen till maybe five to ten seconds, right? Depending upon the size of that particular JavaScript. So why do you actually wait your uh, user for five to ten seconds without even telling them that uh, your site is going to load or not? So the so that is what the thing is about optimization for the start render time. So most of the people say that when it's about uh, start render time, it's just about uh, starting to display the content, which can be consumed to the, uh, by the user. But for me, it's also about uh, as to how fast you can deliver to a non-technical person to understand that your website is not broken and it's going to load in, uh, in uh, after some time. Okay, I mean that is still understandable by the non-technical users, uh, but when it comes to actually making them uh, wait for five to ten seconds, it actually, uh, I mean a person won't be able to differentiate whether your application has uh, stopped working or is it still loading in some, uh, in some way or because of some process. So uh, that's what I'll 
be saying about this. Any other questions? Yep. Yes. Okay, I'm not aware of uh, of the score to be changing that drastically with every page refresh on PageSpeed Insight. Okay, uh, it might be on web page test. I'm not very sure about it as well because I haven't seen it by myself. If it does flicker on the range of uh, one to two or maybe five to ten, maybe that is something that you can uh, actually ignore. But if in case uh, it happens more than that, then maybe there is something on the server side that is happening. Uh, depending upon the logic that you are uh, having onto your uh, uh, for that particular request, so that can actually basically uh, might be triggering a particular uh, if condition or something of that sort, which displays a different content at one request and another uh, on the second request. So, okay. So for the page speed insight, I'm pretty sure that they uh, remove all of their caches whenever they do a uh, page test. So yeah. That is already in place. Uh, a better judge will be uh, you yourself. If you want to actually automate this particular process, uh, you can. Um, uh, I, I'm not actually sure about the open source projects that allow you to actually parse your HTML and then tell you whether there's a op uh, render blocking resource or any of those rules that are there in PageSpeed to actually tell you. Uh, uh, with a grunt task that you can run locally. Uh, but there are, uh, I, I guess you can um, uh, follow the hashtag webper, and there are several resources and several open source projects uh, that people actually uh, discuss. Uh, and maybe there you can uh, find something of this sort. Though uh, there are many contributions made uh, both in the rendering performance and the networking performance as well. So uh, uh, maybe you can uh, look forward to that. One of them is browser perf. Uh, I'm not very sure whether it even allows you to uh, see for your uh, uh, browser performance, for, for your networking performance, uh, via grunt tasks that can run locally. Yeah. But you can do it by yourself uh, via Chrome Dev Tools uh, or any other browser dev tools that you use. Yep. Uh, we are at 3.25. I still have five minutes left. Uh, any other question? OK. How many of you uh, use Google.com to see whether your connection is working or not? How many of you? Just, just be true to yourself. Uh, and uh, for those who don't, which website do you use for uh, testing it? Sorry? Testing of network connection? OK, Facebook is another. OK. OK, Hacker News. Sure, yeah. True. Oh, uh, OK, OK. So uh, what do you guys think is the reason behind you uh, actually opening up Google.com to see whether it's working fine or not? Sorry? It's fast. It's light. Yeah? So why not make, a, uh, make your application work it that way that people actually start hitting up your application every time they do it? So basically, uh, I mean, uh, I'm not very sure if it can be taken up to that level. By that level, I basically mean whether uh, people will be opening it up or not. That basically depends whether they have hit their mind or not, which comes down to the fact as to what is the probability of that person to open up Google.com as compared to your site, right? Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is something that one should really optimize for, that when your customer is actually opening up uh, to just check whether uh, their net is working or not, and just see for your website if it opens up, and that gives an, indi an indicator. So I guess uh, that will be uh, just overridden by the fact that uh, service workers are now in place, and you can uh, even operate offline, right? So how many of you have explored the offline uh, feature via service uh, workers? How many of you? Even a demo will work. OK. Have you heard of it, this concept that service workers allow you to actually uh, make your website go offline? OK. A couple of yes. Achha. Three, four. Uh, is it that the requirement hasn't come in so far, or you don't think, um, I mean, it's worth the deal? It's worth being offline? I mean. For the people who have actually raised up their hand, so I know now. OK. Uh, no answer for now. So maybe I understand that, yeah, uh, requirement hasn't come up so far. But 
for now, uh, what I can say is that if uh, a web application has to go it uh, the same way uh, that a native app has, maybe service workers is the best way to go forward with because it allows you to do exact same thing uh, that you want to do via web applications, uh, via native applications, right? Uh, that is, uh, you are still available even when the network is offline. So something to explore uh, then. Uh, okay, we have still two minutes left. Any other question? Yep. Yes. About the about the fold content above the fold content. Oh yeah. Okay. Oh. Uh, you you actually asked as to how we can optimize the above the fold content is what you asked. Okay. Sure. Okay. Okay. So first of all, what I'll uh, uh, I'll advise, or uh, I mean, it totally depends upon your situation as to what kind of application you have built in. So I'm not very sure about that, but uh, it's a jQuery application. It's a single page application, or what? Okay. So in case if it's not a single page application, maybe may, uh, I mean there might be some uh, I mean HTML that you can render along with some sort of styling uh, with which you can uh, display it to your user on the first pix for the start render. Okay. And then load both both of the scripts asynchronously. I won't even ask you to actually uh, make it load some way faster than the other. I would actually recommend you to load them asynchronously uh, after you are done with the start render. And once you are done with that, then it's uh, I mean whatever uh, resource you want to load in after that, it's your own wish. Yep. But it shouldn't be blocking your uh, I mean um, HTML parsing and uh, the further uh, processes that are involved in uh, uh, making your uh, page render onto the user screen. Okay, so now we are uh, through. We are at our uh, time slot, which is 3.30. So let me connect my uh, screen and get started. Okay, uh, can we have the projector open? So uh, hello, everyone. Uh, the topic of this particular talk is uh, performance beyond page load. I hope you are at the right position. And uh, I have actually mentioned the things that I'll be covering in my talk, which is uh, specifically the rendering performance. I'm uh, not touching upon the networking performance for now, because I thought that uh, it will cater uh, better to the audience of jQuery Conf. Uh, thanks to the jQuery Conf guys who have uh, allowed me to actually present it over here. So this is about me. Uh, I love to have tracks. So in case you want to have any sort of discussion, uh, I'll be happy to have it. Apart from that, uh, my Twitter handle is uh, at the rate Apoor underscore Saxena. So in case you have any sort of questions uh, during this entire talk, or even after you go back home uh, regarding the application that you are currently working upon, uh, you can simply ping me, and uh, maybe I can help you with that as well. Uh, comes in next is the companies that I've worked in past, uh, which consists of uh, SlideShare, DirectEye, and now Wingify. Uh, all of them have actually contributed significantly in the way I perceive performance. Uh, I'll be discussing more at the end of this particular talk, so uh, maybe we can wait till then. Uh, but yeah, that's about my background for now. So let's kickstart the talk. So first of all, uh, let's just see some data, the survey stats, and uh, we'll be have a better uh, understanding as to why, uh, whether we actually uh, require rendering performance to be taken care of or not. Okay. So according to a survey uh, for a particular, uh, by a Googler, uh, what happened was that he actually asked uh, for some insights uh, from the users themselves to tell whether, uh, I mean, what, all, uh, what is the most required feature among the set of features that you are able to see for now, uh, which is smooth navigation, uh, news automatically available in the morning, uh, notification of content, or uh, the others. So as you can see, the topmost is uh, smooth navigation, right? So it's all about that. I mean, people are not even asking you for uh, pinging them via service worker and provide you a notification. What they're asking you is to render your uh, existing application at 60 FPS. 
I mean, have, it, have a smooth navigation running. That's all what they want, okay? So that is the reason that uh, I'm currently having this particular conversation with you and uh, this particular talk. Though I'm pretty sure that um, a lot of you might say that you are not impressed, right? Are you? Are e each of you impressed? I assume you're, uh, you being sitting over here uh, say that you are impressed, but I'll think of, uh, I mean, uh, one or two percent of you who don't think that way. Uh, so there's this other case study uh, by Facebook uh, in which uh, at EdgeConf 2012, they said that uh, when they reduced the frame rate of uh, their web application, um, it reduced their customer interaction or it reduced the engagement of their users on Facebook. So it's uh, something that you should really consider that if uh, your rendering performance of your web application is not awesome, uh, people might be losing or uh, your engagement with the audience uh, might be reducing. So what is smooth interaction? I'll, I'll actually start from the basics and then uh, I'll be pitching up uh, to the advanced topics. So let's start, uh, let's start small. Okay, this something with the projector, maybe I need to reconnect. So regarding uh, the smooth performance of your web page, uh, the devices refresh the screens at uh, 60 frames per second, or they uh, refresh the screens 60 times a second. Now, what happens is that when you're uh, refreshing the screen at 60 times a second, you have got just 16 milliseconds to render a single frame from, uh, from your web application. If you exceed this particular 16 millisecond window, you actually um, exceed, when you exceed this particular frame, uh, your JavaScript is continued and uh, you actually see a performance glitch in your web application, which is basically defined by the term jank. So how many of you have actually come across janky web applications before? Janky web applications? Okay. Uh, no other? Okay. So I guess uh, we are all in sync uh, with the kind of uh, things that we have encountered before. Moving on. When failing to meet uh, the frame budget, uh, actually it's not just about 16 milliseconds, but it's... Uh, it boils down to less than 10 milliseconds when you have to complete the entire operation of uh, from starting from JavaScript to coming into styles and then uh, applying the different operations uh, when you're rendering your uh, web application. So it comes to just six, uh, 10 milliseconds from 16 milliseconds because the rest of the time is taken by the browser to render your uh, I mean page and it's not in your hands to actually optimize it. Comes into uh, running performance. So there are several aspects related to it. Uh, there are different sort of interactions, there are animations. So I'll be covering them one by one, and that's how I'll be going in. So let's start with as to, uh, I mean, what are the things that, are, uh, that we have to take care of when we actually render our application? So 16 milliseconds is a lot, uh, and in a nutshell, the things that we have to do are this. Starting from the JavaScript, you have to apply the styles. Then after which uh, uh, the layout operation triggers up, which is followed by paint and composite. Okay, uh, this is what happens. And uh, in the 10 milliseconds that you have, you have to take care of all of them. What I'll be telling you mostly are the best practices so that uh, none of your JavaScript operations or the CSS operations uh, make you exceed this uh, 10 millisecond window that you have got. So first of all, let's understand as to what each of these component means, okay? So we know about JavaScript and styling, right? So let's start off with the layout then. When you mean layout, layout basically means that uh, you are modifying the structure of your application or any of your, uh, when uh, a web page element um, uh, undergoes some kind of uh, size change, then it basically triggers a layout operation. This is what you can see. I basically uh, made a border, um, a border color red and uh, trying to display as to what is the layout of the different elements onto a particular web page. But this is uh, amazingly huge because, uh, I mean, some elements have got uh, a kind of layout that they shouldn't have, which is exceeding the uh, size that they should have in because uh, they don't need to interact for that particular, uh, I mean, for that particular space that they have consumed. The kind of CSS properties or the CSS properties that uh, trigger a re-layout are these, which is uh, basically related to the size or the positioning of an element. That's what you can understand from that. 
Coming next is paint. Paint operation is basically triggered when uh, there's a layout that happens, and then there's a pixel uh, which gets, uh, uh, I mean, positioned to a different location from its own space. But apart from that, uh, there's a redraw that happens for that particular operation. So that is how you define paint. I guess it's a bit complex, so I'll try to uh, define it via the C uh, CSS properties, which is color. When you change a color, it only triggers a paint operation and not a layout because its position or uh, I mean place or size hasn't changed, right? So that is how you can understand a paint operation. After that is composite. Composting is basically uh, uh, after you're done with the layout and paint operation, when you have to mix all the uh, layers that you have generated so far in the web page, it all come it comes down to the composite operation to make uh, to uh, render them together onto the user screen. So that is what happens in the composite operation. The CSS properties, or uh, if you want to see as to how your uh, web page is segmented into different layers, this is an overview for that. Next comes in, uh, what are the tools at hand uh, that we are going to use in to actually see as to how our page is performing, uh, specifically for the rendering performance, okay? The first one get, that comes in is the FPS meter. I've just given the definition for the frames per second, uh, which is uh, we want to have a 60 FPS uh, frame rate. And uh, to actually gauge your frame rate, you can simply open up your Chrome Dev tools, and uh, you can press the escape button. And it allows you to actually see, uh, or let me just display as of now. So are you able to see the four options that we are having over here? Uh, one of them is show paint rectangles, uh, show composite layer borders. The third one is the show FPS meter. This is what I'm talking about. Now, whenever you do some sort of interaction with this particular page, you are able to see the frame rate uh, going below and up, right? So this is something that you should really look out for uh, when you're doing a scrolling on your, onto your web page or doing some sort of animation. This is something that uh, you should really see or consider to monitor uh, your web page performance specifically the rendering performance. Then comes in profiling with the timeline. Timeline is uh, then another tab on the Chrome DevTools. Uh, I'm not sure about uh, how it is placed on the Firefox DevTools, but yeah, you can find a similar one uh, there as well. So this is what you can see. Uh, this is basically a performance audit that I did earlier for a website by the name materialop.com uh, when actually doing some kind, some kind of interaction with this particular page. And one, uh, when I recorded this particular timeline for this page, this, this is the graph that I saw. Over here at the bottom, you'll be able to see there's uh, two lines. One, the above one describes, uh, I mean, represents the 30 FPS. The other one uh, represents 60 FPS. And once you go above that, it's basically a janky experience. When you go above 60 FPS, it's basically a janky experience. Okay? So basically, timeline is the other tool that you should really consider when it comes to monitoring your rendering performance. Comes in next is show paint rectangles. This is another uh, quite awesome uh, uh, ability that you have uh, with the Chrome Dev tools, which allows you to actually see as to how many elements or what all elements are getting repainted every time you are doing some sort of interaction with your page. So over here, what you are able to see is that there's a kind of green color, right, onto the entire web page. So what, what is represented by this is that the entire web page is getting repainted every time I was uh, doing some sort of interaction. So I'll be, uh, I'll be showing this particular thing, uh, uh, I mean, in my performance audit as well. So you will be able to see as to how you can do it by yourself. But uh, simply going over here and enabling show paint rectangles. Is it now visible? Yeah, so now you can uh, simply enable or disable it from the Chrome Dev tools. Uh, there's how you can enable or disable it. When you see over here, uh, just the scrolling bar is getting repainted onto this particular page. Nothing else is getting repainted. But onto that particular application, the entire page was getting repainted. I'll actually tell you as to what are the different uh, issues are with that particular page that one can encounter uh, while actually performance auditing your own application. Okay? So let's move back. So what are things that we intend to achieve when I say smooth interactions onto your web page? First of all, is a smooth scrolling, right? Whenever you're scrolling onto a particular application, might be a native or a web application, uh, you are able to see that, uh, I mean, that is the uh, best way to actually see whether there's a jank happening or not, right? 
Uh, I, I'm not sure if uh, you've come across an animation, first of all, which is janky. B even before seeing whether a scroll is happening to, uh, is able to proceed smoothly or not. So first is smooth scrolling. So uh, I've listed down some of the things that can actually make you, uh, make your scrolling janky. But uh, uh, I'll actually say it again that uh, these, are, uh, these issues are not comprehensive. But these are some of the issues that I actually see in most of the web applications when I'm performance auditing them. So the first of all is uh, garbage collection event. I guess uh, we had a session yesterday regarding the memory leaks. So you must have been acquainted uh, with what are the different things uh, that comprise of uh, or trigger a memory leak and uh, because of which the garbage collection event triggers up, which takes its own time. And till the time it runs, it does not allow your uh, JavaScript thread to execute. Okay. The next thing that comes up is a uh, JavaScript triggered operation, uh, which uh, further trigger, uh, which, which take a lot of time for the processing. So one of them is layout thrashing. I'll be discussing it uh, further in my slides. Uh, the next thing that comes up is, uh, so there are some libraries uh, that we discussed yesterday. Uh, for example, even famous, which allows you to actually have a, a very smooth scrolling, even saying that you can have a frame rate of 60 FPS. But there are even conditions where just with the styling itself, you can uh, make or you can trigger a janky experience or you can enable a janky experience for your, uh, for your user just with the plain CSS. Okay, so I'll be even uh, talking about that. When I say that, what happens is that there is a lot of repainting that is happening onto the user screen. So there are some CSS operations that can uh, allow you to have it and th uh, thereby making it janky. The next comes in. Uh, in uh, smooth interactions is uh, smooth animation. When I say smooth animation, uh, I basically mean that uh, you are animating different objects onto your, uh, onto your web screen, and during that, you are able to see some sort of uh, janky experience. And uh, most of these operations or the jankiness is triggered when you are doing some sort of other processing or you are triggered some kind of another operation while you are uh, executing your animation. So the key point to note is that when you're doing a single animation, uh, you might not want to uh, trigger any other thing in parallel because that might uh, make you exceed the frame rate uh, or, or the 10 millisecond window that you're already having in, okay? So there was this uh, another person that came to me uh, some time back uh, and uh, he was actually displaying me a particular animation that was run running in when a person clicks onto the slide view and was blurring the other page and what was happening was that uh, that particular sliding out of that uh, side, uh, side view uh, was janky. But that was because of the reason that uh, the other effect that it had onto the other part, which was not animated, uh, that was uh, the reason behind uh, the animation, which was being janky. So I would ask you that uh, once you're through with the animation, do consider making any other operation onto the DOM specifically uh, once you're through with the animation. Okay, I'll be discussing th the same in the uh, slides further, but uh, just keep those things in mind. The next thing that comes up is smooth interaction. So the another thing that you should really want to have in is avoid synchronous operations. That is something that you should really, uh, I mean, try not to have in. For example, uh, when you're doing a dollar dot Ajax and you are passing an, an option which says async false, it basically freezes your screen, right? Until that particular async call is not done. So maybe this is something that you should never have in at all. Comes in next, what are the different pra best practices related to the networking performance, uh, I mean, running performance? So first is uh, avoiding memory leaks. Uh, I guess you, mo I mean, most of you have been acquainted with it, but it's mostly attributes to the uh, different frameworks that we are using and uh, what are the different sort of operations involved in that or the best practices involved, for example, uh, uh, if your fr uh, framework allows you to create views and corresponding models. So when the uh, model get deleted, uh, maybe you actually forgot to uh, delete your views as well. So that basically creates a memory leak and you'll be able to encounter it. And if you don't, then uh, maybe jank is something that will haunt you, okay? So this is something that you should really consider. Comes next is reducing DOM calls. So what, uh, so I, I basically assume that you all must be aware of what the DOM is. Now reducing DOM calls basically means that reading and writing operations onto the DOM, uh, they should be really avoided if possible. Or whenever you want to have it, 
have it in batches is what I intend to say. If you don't, you can basically trigger out a layout thrashing, uh, which I'll be discussing in the next slide, okay? But avoid having in a, a read and write operation onto the DOM. Now, uh, because it's a jQuery conference, uh, an example that I have to give you is basically a dollar body. Now, how many times you might be uh, referencing to it, right? But what you can do is you can basically cache it in variables and then uh, reference to it, uh, reference them to it again and again whenever you want to. Or when you are actually writing some sort of thing uh, inside a loop, you might want to extract it out after the loop. And instead, inside the loop, you can do a string concatenation. And after the loop, you can uh, write it in one go. So that is what when I mean uh, reducing DOM calls. Then comes in forced synchronous layout. What is this? This is basically uh, that after you have done a DOM write, you are actually doing a DOM read. What basically happens is that when you, when you have done a DOM write, and after that you are doing a DOM read, the browser has to actually do the recalculations again to understand whether you changed the property or not of which, of, you, uh, of which element you are reading. So because of that, there's a reflow that happens. So you have to actually avoid this particular thing by either moving your read before your write, or in case you want to have your read after write, then basically batch all of those operations. Because in case you do something of this sort in a loop, it basically will tr trigger layout thrashing. Now I have a small demo to uh, display. So let's go on over here. So this is uh, the example of a library uh, by the name FastDOM, which allows you to actually bash your read and write operations. So this is something that you should really look out for. Uh, I'm not sure if it will be able to load uh, in properly. Uh, I mean, till the time that we have got. So let's allow it to load in, uh, in async, okay? And let's come back to it when uh, it's done. So this is what it does. Uh, it uses request animation frame in the background to uh, First of all, get all the read and write operations. And inside its request animation frame, uh, it basically loops in over all your reads and writes in bashes. And then uh, it does it that way. Instead of, uh, I mean, doing it every time you request for it. Every time you request for a read or write. Comes in next is uh, what are the different potential stroll bottlenecks? So I have, uh, I mean, most of the times when you actually uh, perform a story at your websites, you'll be able to see that when you're actually scrolling, there's a repaint that is happening. How many of you have actually seen it by yourself? Okay, one or two, five, six, ten hands, okay. So let's see it uh, by yourself, okay. So this is like an example that I wanted to display. So when we've triggered a force synchronous layout and we start it, so you will be able to see, uh, I mean, a sort of janky, jankiness, right? So this is something that uh, when you have your layout thrashing, uh, this is a kind of animation that we'll, you'll be able to see. Uh, but when you run it with fast DOM, which is bashing your reads and writes, the way you see it is this. It's less, I mean, uh, better as compared to what was the last version, right? So this is something that you, can, you should really look out for. Fast DOM is the name of that library, but if you don't want to use it, what I'll suggest to you is to bash your DOM, uh, I mean, DOM reads and writes. Coming in next was, uh, the different kind of uh, scroll bottlenecks. So let's see over here. So this is time.com. I intend to audit it again, but uh, just for the sake of actually telling you as to how you can uh, see for yourself as to de whether there is uh, some kind of scroll bottleneck or uh, there or not, you can do it by yourself, which is by simply enabling this particular thing. Here in place, is everybody able to see this thing? So this is a show potential sc scroll bottlenecks in the same position that you see show paint rectangles. When you see this, you are able to see that uh, there's a repaint that is happening onto a scroll. So first of all, the scroll event uh, listener is there in place, and there's some sort of action that is associated with that particular listener, okay? So that is why the entire screen is getting repainted every time you do a scroll. Coming back, this is something that you should really look out for. Uh, this basically says that first of all, via JavaScript, you have triggered a write operation, which is followed by a read operation, and which triggers a forced synchronous layout. So until and unless you put in a request animation frame and you don't actually batch it, you, you will be actually coming across a jankiness on your, uh, in your web application. So this is something that you should really look out for or even implement. 
uh, when you are uh, trying to avoid jankiness on your web application. Comes in next is uh, debouncing your input handlers. So how many of you understand that, uh, okay, so you must have used uh, scroll event listeners, right? And you understand so how many times it fires every time you do a scroll. So debouncing it is really helpful. By what I mean debouncing is that you trigger it only few amount of time as compared to uh, whenever a scroll event listener or the function associated with your scroll event listener is triggered. You can do the same via uh, request animation frame to debounce it. This is an example of what happens uh, when you're not debouncing your input handlers. So there's a touch that is triggered onto the screen of your mobile device, and the composer, uh, the composer thread uh, gets that particular event listener. The next thing that happens is that because you have associated or you're listening to the touch move listener, your JavaScript gets executed, which is associated with that particular listener. Now let's say that if it is taking 50 milliseconds, okay, 15 milli, 50 milliseconds is quite huge. If it is taking that much amount of time, the scroll is blocked for that particular user. He won't be able to do anything. He won't be able to do anything. So that basically means that you are coming across jankiness onto your uh, on your application. Comes next is uh, reducing paint areas. So first of all, I mentioned before that uh, whenever you are scrolling, uh, there's uh, I mean your paint shouldn't get repainted, right? It's just about the new elements that are getting appended up. There's, there's no way that your existing element should get repainted because of it. So that is something that you should really look out for. But apart from that, when you're interacting with a particular uh, element, it is just that element that should get updated and not the entire screen. So let me actually give you an example and demonstrate uh, as to what I uh, basically am trying to convey. So let's go on back to our Chrome Dev Tools. Um, I guess the best way to uh, give a demonstration uh, will be google.com. Okay, so this is taking some amount of time, but till then, uh, be, I, I can basically tell you as to uh, what you don't want to have in, okay? So, you are able to see some uh, show paint, uh, I mean, you're able to see green patches, right? Each one of you is able to see that. What basically that means is that uh, that particular paint, uh, that particular element is getting repainted. Now, because it's a GIF, it has to get repainted, okay? Because uh, there's a new thing that has come up and browser needs to repaint it. But when I actually scroll this particular page, you can see the entire page is getting repainted, right? There's not that, uh, that specific GIF image is getting repainted. It's the entire page that is getting repainted. So this is something that you should really not have. In, uh, in your web applications. It is also, uh, I mean, it can trigger paint storms. So what I meant by, uh, meant by paint storms is that there might be some kind of processing that you're, uh, I mean, executing or some kind of operation that you're executing uh, in your JavaScript that triggers a paint operation to happen on your entire web page. If it is doing something of that sort, you'll be able to see as to what I displayed just before. Uh, which is a paint of the entire screen. When something of this sort happens, jankiness is something that you'll really encounter, okay? So comes on next as to how we can run animations at 60 FPS. The first one is GPU acceleration. I mean, the way GPU acceleration, uh, I mean, there are the different concepts involved in this. So first of all is uh, that uh, you trigger operations via CSS, you don't write via JavaScript. How many of you are actually into the practicing, uh, practice of changing styles via JavaScript? How many of you? I mean, just be true, okay. Some couple of hands, but uh, this is an anti-pattern that you should really want to avoid. What basically happens is that, first, the JavaScript, uh, I mean, uh, when it uh, allows you to do that particular operation, it goes to the CPU, which then, up, uh, up, I mean, uploads all those operations to the GPU, during which rasterization process is what kicks in and which basically delays or, uh, I mean, adds up to the amount of time in which you have to render that particular screen. So in short, you'll want to avoid writing uh, CSS rules via JavaScript is what I intend to say, okay? Yeah, inlining style is different. By what he means is that uh, style block, uh, which is having the CSS rules and not actually having the inline styles with each element, okay? So next comes in, um, okay, how many of you, uh, yeah. 
So other way you can have an element which is having a style attribute along with that. Yeah, so that is the having a style block in place and having the CSS. So the other one is uh, via JavaScript that uh, you have a particular element. Yeah, element dot offset uh, top or something of that sort. So any kind of property that you are changing via JavaScript uh, is something that will trigger uh, this operation to take place, okay? And you really want to avoid it. Yeah, modifying the classes is another way that you can achieve, yeah, to avoid this particular thing, yes. So the next uh, concept that is quite popular these days uh, and is discussed a lot is uh, GPU acceleration via Canvas. So how many of you have actually uh, read that particular case study by Flipboard, uh, which actually uses Canvas to, uh, uh, I mean, render their DOM? Okay, one or two hands. Okay, so what they do is basically use, uh, I mean, hardware acceleration, which is something of this sort, as we can compare, and uh, basically have their entire DOM be replicated inside a canvas. And any sort of interaction that you do is on the canvas, and because it is hardware accelerated, it is having much better performance as compared to the normal DOM. Though this practice comes with a lot of, uh, I mean, it has its own cons and it has its own pros, the pros being that it's because it's hardware accelerated, it has much better performance as compared to your uh, normal DOM when you're uh, doing some sort of interaction. Though the cons of it are that uh, it comes even down to accessibility. For example, not everyone can uh, see your DOM, right? I mean, so there are some special p people who actually uh, have to read that particular DOM. So what Flipboard does is it basically creates a, another DOM which is not visible, but it has all of those contents that you are able to see inside your canvas so that people can even read that particular thing. So you have to take care of it by yourself when you're implementing it in your own project. The other thing apart from that is Canvas is not hardware accelerated on every device. So there are even uh, other mobile devices on which can Canvas is not hardware accelerated and it, your application won't run as performant as it runs on other mobile devices which are having a better hardware, okay? So if you want to actually uh, uh, render your application in the same way on every device, maybe that is something that's not possible. Comes in next is uh, Java, uh, JavaScript animations. So we have used, uh, I mean, we saw yesterday uh, uh, the famous library which does it quite brilliantly. Uh, I mean, rendering animations at 60 FPS. The reason being that they uh, trigger the CSS properties that allow it to be GPU accelerated or totally driven by GPU, uh, which is the reason for it uh, to be run at 60 FPS. So maybe uh, this is something that also uh, you can consider. Though there's this other practice that you can actually uh, use by yourself to run your animations at 60 FPS, uh, which is that when, when, a, when a person clicks onto the particular element or when it uh, does some kind of interaction, for example, a touch on a mobile device, there's a 100 millisecond delay in which you can do some sort of processing that you want to, okay? And when your animation runs in, you don't do actually anything uh, during that particular time. And when you're done with the execution of your uh, animation, you do any other operation that you want to after that. So I, I'm just repeating myself when I said before that when you're doing some sort of animation with, your, uh, with any of your element, you don't do anything uh, in parallel because that can affect uh, the layout of that particular page and might trigger some repaints uh, on that particular web page or web applications of yours, okay? So there's this another uh, library by the name CTA.js uh, built by one of my coworkers, uh, Kushal Grigor, and uh, he applied the same concept uh, by uh, uh, using a different element uh, to first scale up to a particular position that one uh, to which he wants his element to move. And once you're done with the calculation till which position you want to uh, move in, then you trigger the animation. So I guess if you go and uh, check out by yourself the source code of it, you'll be able to better understand that. Comes in next is the CSS animation. Uh, not sure if uh, you actually want to see the demo of it, but uh, yeah, CSS animation is basically using the GPU again and uh, not triggered by the JavaScript. So this is something that you should really look out for. The next thing that comes up is uh, style calculations. So how many of you have actually seen as to what uh, sort of operations happen uh, when you use a CSS property? How many of you have, uh, or maybe even just use CSS triggers by yourself? Okay, one or two hands. Not a lot of people are actually, uh, okay, three, or maybe five in total, right? 
So uh, CSSTriggers.com is another website that you should really look out for uh, when it comes to uh, seeing as to what sort of operations are, uh, are triggered by a particular property. So uh, as I discussed before, uh, that width and other such properties which uh, are responsible for changing the layout or the size of a particular element trigger the layout operation, which is followed by the paint and composite. And then there are properties which uh, allow you to just trigger paint and composite. And uh, the other property by the name transform allows you to just do a composite operation, which is much less as compared to what a uh, layout triggers, right? So maybe you'll want to, uh, so when you are actually listening to maybe a scroll event, transform, I, I would first of all suggest that don't do some kind of DOM read and write because that will in self, uh, itself incur uh, some amount of uh, time for, the, for its operation. But in case you have to, maybe the uh, property that you might want to go with is a property that just, that just changes the composite operation or that just triggers the composite operation and not the layout of paint. So over here you can see there are different properties and associated with them uh, in different colors are the kind of operations that they trigger. So for example, if I now type over here uh, background color, You can see that it just triggers uh, the paint followed by composite. And uh, when I change, uh, when I trigger a transform, it basically does just the composite operation and nothing else. So this, so this uh, particular operation, uh, I'm not talking about the core functionality or what they do, but it is more performant as compared to ch doing a background color upon a scroll, okay? In, in the most simpler terms. Then comes in Web Animations API. How many of you have actually read this spec or have used it by yourself? Okay, one, one hand. Okay, just one. Uh, okay, so Web Animations API is the other uh, uh, standard that uh, is, uh, has, has been introduced and is going to follow up in different browsers and you'll be able to use it by yourself. Uh, I guess I should actually share the demo of it because it looks real promising. So, uh, Using the web animation API, you can do the same thing that you actually uh, currently do via CSS. But you can actually control it in a much efficient way via JavaScript. So it gives you a much better control. Uh, so this is the demo of it. This uses uh, web animations API. And uh, you can check out its source code. I have already uh, published my slides on slideshare.net. Uh, you, you'll be able to actually go to that. And I'll be sharing in the link afterwards. But uh, as you can see, the animation that is currently there is uh, running at 60 FPS. There's no jank that you are experiencing as of now. And it is using Web Animations API, OK? Comes in next is uh, GIFs and performance, OK? First of all, GIFs and performance don't go hand in hand. I'll actually want to open up uh, a website uh, by the name 9gag.com. And till the time, I can actually tell you as to why GIFs and performance don't go hand in hand. As you can see as of now, I have uh, triggered this particular uh, op, uh, I mean, feature in Chrome that allows you to see as to what part of uh, this particular web page are getting re-rendered. As I mentioned before, that because it's a GIF, this particular element, which is the GIF itself, is getting repainted. So in case you, you have some sort of this application where, you, where you, are, you are having several GIFs on your web page, maybe you, want, you don't want to uh, leave it uh, as it is, right? You want to do something uh, the way 9gag, 9GAG does. So what you can see as of now is that there's a GIF, but let me open up the Chrome Dev con uh, console, and what you're able to see is that only this particular thing is getting repainted. But what, what if when I go over here, okay, as you can see, for the above image, okay, the one that, uh, that was just getting repainted, it has stopped getting repainted. Okay? So when a particular image isn't focused, only, only then you should actually uh, make it animate or uh, whatever th uh, thing that happens with its re-rendering, it's fine till that point of time when it's in focus. When if it is not, why are you actually getting it repainted? It will add up to the, uh, to the repaints that are happening onto your web page, and uh, it will be... Uh, I mean, making you exceed your 10 milliseconds window, OK? So this is something that you should really look out for. Comes next is the performance audit for uh, the website that I just displayed. 
uh, which is uh, materialup.com. So let's go upon that. And let's just see as to what is happening. So first of all, uh, what you're able to see is that uh, a slider came up when I was just scrolling, right? When I scrolled up, there was a slider which is in place. Let's just see as to what is the styling for that particular slider, uh, or for that particular header. So this is that particular element. Okay. So as you can see, uh, the CSS property Are you able to see that it is position fixed? So there's this rule, or, or there's, this, the, there's this thing that happens with position fixed elements, that they get repainted every time you do a scroll, or every time you navigate, I mean, you go up and down. Because, uh, because, they, are getting, because they are fixed onto your web page, uh, that particular thing gets repainted. Now, depending upon the size of that particular element, uh, either, your pa either your entire page will get repainted, or it will be just that particular element gets repainted. But when there are several elements that get repainted onto a particular page, depending upon their size, there's an action taken by the browser, which is by the name Union of Damaged Reason Regions. Has anyone heard of it before? Union of Damaged region Regions? Okay, so what happens is that uh, when there are several elements that are getting repainted, the browser tries to optimize it, okay? And tries to get, uh, I mean, the, the, uh, a bigger element or a bigger portion of the area to get repainted instead of uh, repainting several elements individually, okay? What I wanted to say is that in case you are having a position fixed element, see for it that it doesn't get repainted. What you can do basically is uh, say will change and uh, followed by transform. What, be, uh, what this does is it basically promotes that particular element onto its own layer. As of now, you can see that that entire screen is getting repainted, but there is a different reason behind that, uh, but earlier, you were able to see a special focus onto the header, okay? But now it's not, because we have uh, implemented this particular CSS property which allows, uh, which basically tells the browser that hey, this particular element is getting repainted, so maybe you want to promote it to its own layer. Now you might be thinking that uh, why doesn't uh, browser does it by, by itself, right? I mean, why, why, why is it left upon us to take care of it? But there are different concepts involved uh, in that. Uh, for example, anti-aliasing uh, for a particular text, in case you do that. So for higher DPIs, that is uh, retina, retina screens, a browser already promotes these position fixed elements into its own layer. But when it comes to your normal screens, uh, for example, your uh, MacBook Pros or anything which is not retina, in that point of time, you have to take care of it by yourself. So uh, in case you, you are able to see that it is significantly contributing to your FPS, uh, then maybe uh, will change transform is a property that you will want to have on top of those elements, okay? Then comes in uh, time.com. Not much about time. Uh, the only thing was that, uh, I mean, it's a repaint that is happening every time you do a scroll. So this is something that you should really avoid, uh, that the event listeners that you are listening to or the events that you are listening to, you're not doing a lot of operations in them. Because if you do, it can make you... Uh, I mean, skip your frame and uh, trigger a uh, jank onto your web application. So uh, that is about it. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. OK. True, it's uh, very true. And if you actually see the different talks that have happened before uh, and in IO 2015, uh, I mean, the Chrome Dev tool is doing, uh, I mean, most of the things by itself. But when it comes to your own business, uh, maybe you'll have to look deeper into it, right? So what was uh, discussed yesterday in maybe uh, in the famous talk was that, uh, I mean, there are some things that have been done by the developers themselves with the use of library uh, that allows you to do, uh, I mean, or use uh, the GPU acceleration for uh, performing animation. Because, uh, I mean, at most of the times, you can't leave it to the hands of browsers, right? Because you don't actually understand at what point of time this particular spec which is in discussion will uh, actually come in and will be available to most of your users. So these are the different things that you have to think about yourself because it is you uh, who are handling your business and not the people uh, in charge of the browsers, right? But obviously, 
This is something that uh, really should be considered by the browsers themselves. Exactly. So in support of your, uh, I mean, uh, I mean your views, I'll say that all of these practices that I just said, they are mostly a, a kind of hacks that you have to inculcate in your uh, application, right? It, it can be a different strategy altogether as you uh, thought about, uh, 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 I mean, um, what is that thing that, that was using Canvas hardware acceleration? So in that particular case, Flipboard. Uh, so maybe that's a different strategy altogether or when you're using a famous uh, library. This is something of a strategy. But when you think about these uh, practices, maybe you can relate it to hacks. But yeah, I mean, this is something that even the browser team is currently working upon. But till that time, all these things are taken care of or, uh, I mean, made performant. Till then, uh, I mean, we have to take it by ourselves because uh, it's our businesses, right? Any other questions? OK, one more. Yeah. Yes? Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what I'll say is that, uh, I mean, request animation frame does not uh, actually think about as to how many frames it can uh, uh, do it or, uh, uh, I mean, trigger your particular thing. Uh, it does not actually say that it will be doing it 60 times a second. It basically sees a lot of other different things that are involved. For example, on your mobile device, depending upon uh, the, uh, the battery percent that is left on that particular device, if it's in the range of even 15 to 20%, it starts uh, reducing the request animation frame count. Because at then, when you're doing an animation, it's using a lot more memory, uh, a lot of power as compared to when uh, it is being slow. So in, at times, you might want to leave it to the browsers themselves to optimize it because you don't actually want to consume a lot of battery, right? I mean, so there are several factors involved. It is not just this, but it's better to leave that decision upon to them. Yeah. Any other questions? Yep. Sorry? Frame is basically the uh, window that you have got in which you have to basically uh, re-render your page. So that is, uh, I mean, uh, 16 millisecond is the window that justifies your frame. Uh, is, okay. So basically, uh, when you, uh, okay, have you seen this other, uh, uh, I, I won't say that a toy, but there was this other, uh, uh, other thing where uh, you were actually, it was, I guess it's by the name Bioscope, right? Uh, in which you are able to see, uh, in which through a hole you are able to see a picture running in. And what happens on top of it is that there is a man who is uh, running a particular uh, movie or anything, okay? And what he tries to do is it, he tries to run it fast. So the way it happens is that there's this concept involved with the name, uh, uh, which is by the name persistence of vision. So in that, the, uh, if you have to see different frames, right? Because what is happening when you're rendering a particular picture is that there are different screenshots that you are seeing. When there are 60 frames in one second, you are actually able to see a continuous uh, uh, operation or an animation, okay? When there are uh, 10 frames, you are able to see that there's a discontinuation between them. So that is how you define a frame. Uh, was this answer, okay. Any other question? Yep, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. So as I mentioned before, uh, uh, when I said about uh, the CSS properties or the CSS operations that get triggered via uh, JavaScript. So what? Uh, so let's start with the CSS only. Uh, when it happens, sorry. Okay, so when you start off with the page load, okay. So maybe, uh, 
I would recommend that, uh, I'm not sure about the time as of now. Uh, it's 4.17, maybe I have exceeded my time, but uh, I can contact with you and then I can tell you more. But for everyone else who wants to know it, uh, there's this Chrome tracing tool uh, that you can use by yourself, which actually delivers every frame and every paint that you can see by yourself. Apart from that, timeline is also the one that will actually allow you to see as to what all operations are happening uh, when your page is getting loaded. So uh, there's how I can uh, tell you about that, I mean, in that particular time. So thank you, thanks a lot for the kind audience. Uh, I hope I answered most of you.